Um, good afternoon. Um, let me welcome everybody to the, today's Digital Humanities Lunch and especially warm welcome stressed to the speaker, to James O'Sullivan um, of the University of Sheffield, who is our today's guest and who is going to tell us about applying uh, computer methods to, um, to, to literary criticism, which is one of the most uh, vibrant topics in digital humanities. Yeah. Uh, I have been just asked by uh, Professor Gurski to say a few words about James. Uh, well, I have just learned that James has um, a degree in the sciences, in computer sciences, which I didn't know a few minutes ago. But I know James as a literary scholar and as a digital humanities. We met like four years ago, oh, yeah. five yeah. years ago. Yeah. and. Um, uh, James took my course on stylometry in Leipzig, Germany. That was a couple of years ago, and I must say, I have to say that James was one of the most brilliant students I have ever met. There were two people in this course. There was Christoph Schoch and there was James O'Sullivan. Two brilliant guys. We hosted um, Christoph Schoch a couple of uh, a couple of months ago here in this place. And now it's time for <laughs> it, it's James's turn. So I'm really glad to to have you here. Yeah, well, uh, thank you, thank you all for, for having me. It's um, it's uh, a real pleasure to be uh, to be invited to speak at such a such a prestigious institute. Uh, and uh, of course, my first time in uh, my first time in Krakow was uh, during the DH conference in um, uh, in July as part of the uh, the Digital Humanities Conference. And um, it's uh, it's you know when I was here, I, I was only here for three or four days, and I thought you know. I need to get back here soon. After I realised that I'd be back here several months later, so it's a it is a pleasure to be here, and thank you very much. And it's particularly a pleasure because what I'm going to be speaking about today is I'm going to be speaking about the application of computer-assisted methods to uh, elit criticism. And what I mean by elit criticism is electronic literature. Um, and one of the things about about Poland is uh, obviously you have a, a huge, uh, a large community, particularly in this city, you have a massive community of uh, of very established um, and high profile digital humanities scholars. Um, but the, uh, you also have a very rich tradition in in, uh, in in digital artistry and in electronic literature, both from a, a critical and a, um, both from a critical and a, pr a practitioner perspective. Um, so. With that, an overview of what I what I'm going to be what I'm going to be talking about over the next uh, half an hour to forty minutes. I was told to keep it to a half an hour to forty minutes. I'm told that nobody ever does, but I will keep it to <laughs> a half an hour to forty minutes. Um, so first and foremost, I'll give you an outline of what electronic literature is, because I appreciate that. Well, a lot of you are probably familiar with various different aspects of DH. Um, and a lot of you are literary scholars, so you might have a sort of familiarity with the term electronic literature. And it is one of these sort of more uh, emergent and, and esoteric areas of literary criticism. Um, so I will give an outline of what it is. And the reason I do that is because there are a number of reasons why some of the methods that we use in digital humanities in terms of computational uh, computer assisted approaches to criticism aren't that applicable to electronic literature. Um, and when Matchy said that I have a background, that I have a degree in the sciences, being kind, my, I did my Bachelor of Science and my MSc in Computer Science, but I don't consider myself a scientist. I mean, I was just introduced to a, a physicist, you know. Um, so I'd be interested to see what you know, you know, real scientists, what she think about, uh, you know, some of the ways we could possibly get around some of the issues that you have with the application of of, of computer assisted methods of literary criticism to electronic literature. Um, and in doing that, I'll outline, you know, uh, some of the things. You know, I'll basically get at the idea of why it is, the, why it is that more elite scholars, uh, you know, haven't been using computational methods for, for, uh, 
for uh, literary criticism. And this is, I mean, this is somewhat surprising in the sense that because, I mean, when you think about electronic literature, and um, you know, the, the people who create, a lot of the people who create electronic literature, a lot of the authors and artists, they are themselves critics. You find a lot of them are kind of scholar practitioners. Um, so naturally, these, these are people who are naturally drawn to the digital because they've used computational affordances to sort of reimagine, you know, literary aesthetics. Um, so it's interesting that they haven't equally been drawn to the kind of computational affordances of, 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 uh, of the digital, or the critical affordances of, of the digital, rather. Um, and we get at maybe why that is. Um, and of course, I have been, I'll outline some failures uh, in terms of, you know, why I haven't been able to apply certain methods. But I'll also show you some successes and where is that, you know, you can apply um, you know, criticism. I should note that this is, I started thinking about this, uh, it was probably about this time last year. It was uh, yeah, it was it was uh, the date is up there. Uh, yeah, it was January. Uh, it was January of this year. Um, I was invited to to launch um, to give a, a short talk at the launch of uh, Washington State University Vancouver's um, Electronic Literature Lab. Um, and I have uh, I'll be tweeting. I, I have links to everything I'm referencing up on the slides, um, and the slides will be ava made available afterwards. But I've also um, after the talk, I have a whole range of tweets ready to fire out that uh, have all the links to all of the relevant sources that I'll be citing. And I'll stick to I'll stick to DH uh, Krakow hashtag on that so that you'd be able to um, you'd, be, you'd be able to find them. But basically, what I did at this talk was I, I kind of issued something of a call to arms, um, where I said to the community of of Eden scholars that you know we needed to start uh, looking at the ways that we could apply computer system methods to to our discipline. Um, because I think it, it, it's, 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 uh, if, if, we, if we continue to neglect the, the opportunities that, that DH methods offer us, then uh, I think our field is going, our discipline is going to be impoverished, impoverished for that. Um, and of course, the Electronic Literature Lab is it's one of the sort of foremost resources in the world in terms of uh, it's got one of the finest collections of first, first generation electronic literature. So I'm not going to get into a big discussion about what the digital humanities are, but you might be thinking, first off, well, what exactly is this to do with digital humanities? And of course, I'm sure there's people who've come here and offered, you know, engaged in discussions on what DH is, or what the digital humanities are, because for me, digital humanities are is a collection of activities. Um, but I think it's useful that I do give you my sort of understanding of DH, what DH is to me, so that you have an understanding of the context that I'm coming from. And of course, I'm happy to, to, to argue with this, argue this with, with many of you. And I think the more we argue about well, how we define DH, the better the, the field will be. Um, but obviously, it's the application of sophisticated computational tools and methodologies to assist research in the arts and humanities. This is the kind of thing that you know many many people in the room possibly do. I know that this is you know a lot of the work that the, that this institute does. I know you know one of the areas that matches a a world leader in, um, and it's you know something I do myself in my own work. I often use computational methods to do analysis of um, you know print literature, um, which is again I know matchy. Um, but for me, digital humanities is also about informing sort of uh, technological discourse and, and computational creativity with sort of the critical principles that we take from our tr traditional training as as humanists. Um, and this is what a lot of people do in the world of ELIT. So one of the things about electronic literature is, you know, you often hear people saying, well, you don't really need a technical understanding because it's just literature. Well, it is literature, but um, uh, it's very different in the sense that it relies uh, very heavily, I mean, we, I'll, I'll get more into what electronic literature is in a moment, but it relies very heavily on, on an inherent computational aesthetic. And it isn't very, uh, a lot of people like to conceptualize it as, as, as critical code studies. Um, and for, in that sense, for me, digital humanities isn't just about technical applications, but technical understanding. And if you're going to understand the work of electronic literature that has something uh, sophisticated in a literary context going on with its code, you need to have an understanding of how to read that code so you can make the the uh, conclusions to build a, an argument around the, the literary merit, merits of a particular piece. And what I'm essentially trying to do here is take a step, go a step beyond this. So up to now, I've kind of been working in these two veins independently. So in some, sometimes I apply, I mean, the bulk of my work is based on applying critical theory to, 
since the screen fiction is, you know, call it what you want, electronic literature, screen fiction, you know, new critical media studies, whatever you want to call it. That's what I do spend most of my time doing. But I've also spent a lot of time applying computer system methods to the, the study of, of print literature. And now I kind of progress to this third phase where I'm applying the computer assisted methods to the computational uh, computational art of the electronic literature. Um, and there have been previous attempts at doing this which which I'll show you, but they're they're very they're very sparse, they're very far through between. I hope everyone can understand my accent. Um, so what is the electronic literature? So um, in general terms, it's uh, people point to the definitions offered by Catherine Hales, who um, who basically says that who describes it as born digital. Um, I mean, she describes it as a first generation digital object created on a computer and usually meant to be read in a computer. So essentially, when we think about uh, computational literature or, think, or electronic literature, we're thinking about works of literature that have an inherent computational aesthetic. So a piece where some element of the some aspect of the creative elements of the piece come from the fact that it is on a screen so this would typically now one of the issues with electronic literature of course is that definition it resists stable definition because because of the exponential rate in which technology advances you know what if we do, you know if we define the electronic literature of today, it could be completely. It will be completely different from the electronic literature of five years from now, which is one of the things we look at in this in this uh, in this presentation, which really looks at sort of the evolution of electronic literature. Um, so one of the ways, one of the things we really need to do in 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 this field is sort of try and avoid prescriptive definitions, and really, you know, you need to get a sense of what electronic literature is through descriptive. Uh, explorations and just sort of you know seeing what it is as opposed to trying trying to find what it is. Uh, but typically we're excluding from this definition things like you know ebooks. So we're excluding remediated text that is. Um, I mean when you think about something like an ebook, something like a Kindle. I mean we're very much still thinking in print in that context. I mean it is an electronic file on an electronic device, um, but it is very much bound by the. The, the typical constraints of print. Uh, whereas when we're dealing with electronic literature, we're thinking about something that actually uses the affordance of the digital to sort of reimagine its, its literary aesthetics. I mean, a good way, um, the, um, Jessica Pressman uh, has a fantastic book, uh, Digital Modernism, where she basically says that this is, uh, she argues that this is a rejuvenation of the modernist aesthetic in the sense that it's authors trying to make it new again. Now, of course, you could, Problem, that's problematic in some sense, in, in the respect that um, you know modernism sort of seeks to subvert the popular, which is in many respects the contrary of what electronic literature does. But that's possibly a debate for another day. Um, so, to that end, I'm going to give you a sort of a brief outline of um, electronic literature. Um, so that you kind of have an under a sense of, of, I mean, just cu out of curiosity, on a show of hands, how many people here are familiar with the field of electronic literature? Okay, so this is useful then. Um, I mean, for those, if anyone here is involved in game studies, you're very quickly going to notice a lot of affinities between what you do in game studies and and, uh, and what we do in the field of electronic literature. So essentially the field, I mean, it first emerged in well, I mean, what the first work of e people point to the first work of electronic literature going back as far, far as the 40s and 50s, but I mean, it really started to sort of consolidate as a field around the mid 80s, um, and we started to see, when well, we saw the emergence of um, works like Judy Malloy's um, Uncle Roger and, and works like uh, Afternoon, a uh, story by Michael Joyce. I mean, the first, the kind of first wave of electronic literature was very much centered around. Um, hypertext fiction, and that was largely a consequence of um, a collection of authors that we now refer to as collectively refer to as the Eastgate School, because they were published by uh, a U.S.-based uh, publishing company run by a guy named Mark Bernstein um, called uh, Eastgate Systems, and they basically created what Eastgate did was they created a platform called StorySpace that was essentially a hypertext authoring system. And um, authors adopted this, and because you know you have to remember that 
this was back in the, in the, in the mid-80s, you might think, well, why do they need an authoring system to create you know, simple hypertext? Um, you know, this was the day before things like Dreamweaver and WYSIWYGS. Um, you know, this was, this was, this was very uh, competition sophisticated for the time. And I mean, of course, that's the thing about, one of the things about the electronic literature is that from a material perspective, it's, it's, very, uh, it's very situated in its, in its time. Um, but basically, you had a lot of hypertext fiction where essentially what you had, the, the main aesthetic evolution here was, uh, was choice. Um, interactivity, as many scholars refer to it, but that again is problematic because interactivity and choice aren't the same thing. Um, but essentially, what you had was you had a number of you had a number of what we call lexia, which are essentially blocks of text that progress the narrative. And as you progress through this narrative, you had basically choice in terms of you know how you how you progress or how you traverse, as we say, through through the through the narrative. Um, now, of course, as many of you here, religious scholars will know. There was hypertext fiction a lot. One could certainly classify as hypertext fiction before the evolution of the electronic hypertext. So the most common example of this would be, um, you know, Borges' Garden of the Forking Paths, which in many ways is, is hypertext fiction. Um, but this is really using this was bringing the the, the genre to its, um, you know, to its to its zenith in the sense that it was availing of computational affordances to do something new with with that style. Um, and of course, hypertext fiction is still sort of the idea of choice, the idea of you know these branching paths in the narrative, um, and this notion of um, of sort of uh, readerly control is still very much you know at the at the core of of the electronic literature and and, and literary gaming. Um, you know, other people have done um, you know very simple but but aesthetically powerful things. Uh, Michael McGuire. Who is a um, who is an Irish elite author? He's probably our most prominent one. Um, you know, he's done things where he's he's written various uh, HTML pages, but hidden in the underlying code, there is uh, there are various hints. I mean, he's very much um, aligning himself with the sort of Nabokov tradition here. You can see the kind of layering that happens in Pale Fire. You can see that it's been represented here. Um, uh, there's obviously. Um, there's a considerable volume of um, of what we call a narrow base or database uh, driven narratives now. Actually, uh, I mean a lot of a lot of the first generation electronic literature was in itself uh, database driven. Um, so some of the stuff that we're going to get onto a bit is going to be contextual. A lot of a lot of my sort of scholarship is informed by. Um, my practice as a, as a publisher. So I run a small publishing house called New Binary Press, and we publish print literature, not a lot, but we do publish only very select uh, things that we publish in print. Uh, but we also publish uh, electronic literature. In fact, the press was set up to publish electronic literature. Print literature came as an well, actually, print literature came because we needed to fund the, fund the press. You, can, you typically can't sell electronic literature, which is, a, again, a whole other, a whole other discussion. Um, but two of the works that we've uh, two of the works that we've we've published are, are based on databases. So I said I use them as an example. The first is a work called Holes, uh, which is written by um, Graham Allen, which you can find at holesbygrahamallen.org. Again, I'll, I'll tweet out all these links. Um, and essentially, what Holes is is it's a well. I'll tell you how Holes came about. So when I was um, I first met Graham about uh, it was about five years ago now. And um, he told me that he wanted to write a digital poem. This was actually just before, this was the first thing that New Brandy Press published. This was essentially how New Brandy Press started. And he told me he wanted to publish a, a poem, um, a digital poem. So I said, okay, show me your digital poem. And he took out this little, this little letter bound notebook and he showed me basically a lot of, lot of handwritten lines of, of poetry. And I said, well, okay, that's that's lovely. What do you want to do with it? He said, I want to, I want to put, I want to digitize this. And I said, okay, but that's not really a digital poem. That's just remediated text. That's just that's just a poem. Um, and what he then told me was that what he was doing and why it needed to be a digital poem was he was writing one line a day, and he intended to write one line a day for the rest of his life. 
And the night thought, well, you know, you're not going to do that. But he's been doing it now for 10 years. Actually, this is the 10, this month is the 10 year anniversary. Um, and so, I mean, that is a, a form that, you know, could not be published. Uh, you couldn't bind that in, in the codex form. Um, I mean, you could, but you'd be bringing out an awful lot of editions. And um, so, you know, the, the, the digital was the only way that we could actually, you know, bring this, this poem to the world. And that, in a sense, is a very, uh, you know, seemingly trivial, but, you know, truly significant um, example of what, um, of what electronic literature is. You know, this poem had to exist as a, as a work of digital art. It, it, it couldn't exist as a work of print. Um, you can find more. We recently published an essay on it in, in Hyper is the issue 15, which is a, a digital media journal. Um, um, and no, another example is uh, Remembering the Dead, which is a work that we actually we haven't published this yet. It's but published in the next few days. Um, it's a, a work by um, an American artist, John Barber, who basically is after taking a database with all of the um, with, that contains all of the names of the people who died during the Troubles. Uh, the Troubles was a conflict in Northern Ireland that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, and that most historians point that it was at its height between the 1960s and early early 2000s. Some would argue it and has never never ended, but historically, it's, it's this database situated in that context, um, and he takes all of those names and he renders them on the screen in, in a way that's uh, that's very provocative. Um, and I go, you know, these are both built out of databases. They are very, I mean, all that holds is, um, from a material perspective, from a paratextual perspective, I mean, obviously it's, you know, the significance is still very much in the, in the text, you know, the content of the piece. But from a, from a paratextual perspective, this is just a database. You know, once a week, Graham sends me the lines, you know, he emails me the lines, and I update the database. That's the process that we operate. And the same with remembering the dead. You know, it's you know, because obviously there's some JavaScript and what's for the for the sort of visual elements of it, but the, the back end is essentially a, a database. Um, generative fiction in recent years has been a rise of things. This is a piece that I published in 2013 by Nick Monford. So generative fiction typically uses some um, you know, it can be something very sophisticated in terms of algorithm, it can be something as simple as uh, what round does. So generative fiction essentially uses some com computational process. To automatically generate, uh, automatically generate work of fiction. I mean, typically it's it's a means of um, what you're doing. And so what what round is is it's essentially it's it's um, it's it's a Python script that's tied into a WordNet. And typically, what generative literature does is it, it generates literature based on some you know syntactic syntactical uh, um, pre-coded principles that the author has. Uh, has decided for creative works. Um, you see this a lot now in visual arts. Um, but that's an example of, of, a, of a very popular genre now. Um, I had a video to show you very, so this, we're gonna leap forward now into very contemporary, sophisticated things. Um, but I'm afraid if I, like <laughs> yeah, it's, um, I know I work at a publicly funded institution as well, so I know what <laughs> I know what slow computers are like. Okay. So essentially, this is um, is that is that clear? That's, that's yeah. That's reasonably visible. I mean, this isn't this this important. It's just essentially what you have here is uh, this is a, a work of electronic literature developed um, by a group, a UK-based group, um, led by a, um, a 
uh, Jessica Curry and Dan, uh, Dan Pinchbeck. Uh, this is called Pure Esther. Uh, the name of the, the development company is the Chinese room. And essentially what you are, I mean, I'll describe what's going on here. You have, uh, it's, some people have classed it as a walking simulator. So basically you um, show up on, uh, on an island that many people point as, um, well, we, we know it's one of the, uh, it's modeled off the sort of the Hebrides in, in Scotland. And um, you, you don't do anything. So all of the typical elements of gamification are absent in the sense that you just walk. You can't essentially die. Um, there aren't any real objectives in the sense that you walk to the end of, of, the, of the journey. Um, you know, there's nothing to collect. There's no puzzles to solve. Um, you just, you just, you walk. Um, and as you walk, various lexia reveal themselves to you um, in the form of, of monologues been, um, been offered by the, the protagonist. Um, and it, it doesn't come across here, but this is, um, I mean, a very graphically sophisticated, very immersive experience. Um, one of the things that um, I mean, Jessica Curry is a, is a, um, is a composer. So I mean, everything from the visuals to the, you know, the, the orchestral music behind it is is, is very very sophisticated. Um, and it's this. I mean, this is this is from a, a computational perspective. I mean, this is a sophisticated video game. This is, I mean, this is a large production. The, the Chinese room have, I think it's, uh, I think about 11 people working there. You know, so this is a, you know, which is, you know, not big and, uh, which is big for an independent developing uh, developer. Um, but again, the emphasis is very much on the literature. And we, we think about, I mean, what I'm getting at here is, uh, electronic literature is, is very broad in the sense that, I mean, some of you might be sitting there now thinking, well, how does, you know, how does this differ from, say, a film? I mean, the privilege, I mean, the way we need to think about electronic literature is Astrid Enslin, um, she wrote a fantastic book a couple of years ago called Literary Gaming, where she said, we, she argued that we need to start thinking about electronic literature on a legal literary spectrum. And basically what she meant by that is, on the one hand, we have the ludic, so we have play and all of the elements that you find in, you know, typical games, okay? Uh, so things like, you know, objective-driven narrative. And on the other hand, on the other hand, you have language. So you have books that, you have uh, works that uh, create their uh, aesthetic effect through, through, through words, okay? And in a, every work of electronic literature is somewhere on that spectrum. So on some text you're gonna see the privileged language, others are going to see the priv privilege deluded. Um, and a work like um, The Arrestor is interesting because, while well, it has these very, very sophisticated um, computational components in terms of it is a, you know, it's a very complex development, I mean, the story is still, in a lot of respects, driven by these lexia, so it's still very much privileged language, language in a lot of way, ways. So, what does that mean for computational criticism? Well, It means a lot. So, for those of you that here that are familiar with computational criticism, which I think is a lot of you, you will see that there's a lot of electronic literature presents a number of barriers to the methods that we typically use in the, in the digital humanities. Um, some, not all of which, are listed are listed here. So, first of which is the volume of your text. So, if you're going to apply some statistical based method. To, uh, to text, you need to have a, 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 a robust statistical sample. Um, and one of the issues that you have with electronic literature is that it's, it's getting that volume of text. Now this isn't necessarily about the quantity of the text. A lot of electronic literature, for example, uh, the Chinese or the rest of the piece I just showed you, all of the lexia is put together in that piece is about 8,000 words, so it's sufficient to draw that into a computation analysis alongside other, alongside other texts. Um, but the problem is these data sets can be difficult to obtain because you have to, in a lot of cases, you would have to manually transcribe that text. 
because a lot of these systems or a lot of these works, uh, particularly sort of, uh, not so much now, but we've kind of lived through what people refer to as the flash moment, which is where a lot of authors were creating their, their works of electronic literature in flash. Um, and because that's a closed proprietary platform, if you, you know, have a, have a work of flash um, that has a lot of language, I mean, as far as the machine is concerned, that's essentially a visual work. Um, and you can't extract that, certainly not using any, uh, any intuitive means. Um, so that's one of the problems. It's, it's a question, you know, the, line, the, the, the text is there inside of these pieces, but getting access to that text is very, very problematic. When you're dealing with something like Holes or Remembering the Dead, you know, works that are essentially, you know, narrow bases, works that the, you know, are, are driven by narrative, are driven by databases, it's much simpler because you can simply just access the database, um, or you can draw the plain text down from the, from the front end. Whereas um, with something like the arrestor, you can't do that. So it does fall back on things like transcription. Some of them are built in open platforms um, because I mean a lot of these sort of um, more sophisticated, newer, contemporary works emerge out of um, the sort of mod community. So if there's any gamers here, you'd be familiar with mods, which is essentially when someone modifies. So when a big developer releases a, a, a title. And they, they release it, they, it's basically open, so people can create modifications for it. Um, so works, a lot of these sort of contemporary works of electronic literature emerge out of that tradition. And in some cases, early versions of them are available in a way that you can pick them apart and extract the text. But that's not always the case. The other thing then is the extra textual context. So things like... Um, Unlike print literature, audio and um, visual is obviously, obviously there's a lot of antecedents in terms of the visual uh, aesthetics that we see in electronic literature. So you, know, you, can, you can draw parallels here between the, the you know, concrete poetry movement, the fluxus movement and so on. But obviously this is visual taken to its extreme in the sense that you're, you know, you're navigating immersive three-dimensional spaces that represent the you know, real world uh, location, for example. Uh, gestural things. So all of these things that you know. I mean, one of the one of the criticisms of of uh, of distant reading is that you know it it's, it it, redu it removes context and it's 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 very reductive in that sense. Well, this is particularly the case with electronic literature, um, where a lot of the actual um, a lot of the value in the content isn't even contained within the text. That's not to say it's not literary. It's just it's not privileging language. Uh, the other thing is, is preservation and access. It's very hard to get access to a lot of these works. So I showed you examples of, of first generation hypertext fiction. You might think, well, that would be interesting to analyze these. And one of the things that I've been doing, um, I've been exploring recently, is how we can, um, how we can draw, um, basically identify trends in basically the paths, the traversal paths that people take through these works from a quantitative perspective, so essentially just, uh, essentially just tracking link hopping, um, which would be very easy to do on a, on a, on a first-generation hypertext fiction, but we don't have the first-generation hypertext fiction. If you want to read um, a lot of these works, you have to go to places like the Electronic Literature Lab in Vancouver, where they have a wonderful resource where they've maintained the first-generation Mac that these things run on. They have the first generation floppy disk, and you know, but you know, um, even if you had the money, you just can't get these things because they don't exist. Um, and then there's there's a whole issue of layering. So a lot of computational methods deal with text in a very a surface level, a very. Uh, They deal with surface level text in the sense that, you know, for example, if you're working with a, say, a work um, like uh, the one I showed you, McGuire's, where a lot of the sort of semantic value is actually embedded in the underlying code, you might necessarily detect that with specific um, computational uh, practices. Um, and then there are instances where the language may be extremely limited. There are instances where the actual presence of, of words is actually is, is quite limited, um, so you it, it, you know it would be hard to form your robust your robust data sets. So, <clears throat> when looking at the ev evolution of electronic literature, I had to say to myself, well, okay, well these are all the barriers that are presented to me. How is it that I can actually go about using computational methods to 
draw some meaning from how it is that the electronic literature has changed, has changed over time. Um, and there was basically two ways I wanted to look at this. I wanted to look at what I could tell me in terms of content. So I wanted to say, well, what can computational methods tell me about the content of specific works? And then I wanted to look at community. So how it actually has the movement, both in terms of its, both in terms of an aesthetic and practitioner sense, how has that evolved over time? Um, and so essentially the approach I was taking here when applying computational methods to the evolution of the electronic literature was, I was coming at it from a, from a textual and a contextual sense. So I was interested in both the, you know, the contents of the works and, and, and the movement that, that evolved around them. Um, and this essentially brings me to that, that central question, you know, can our understandings of electronic literature benefit from, from distant reading? And this is where I began before I got to this, this notion of evolution. So just to give some, some simple examples, if we just apply a very simple frequency analysis to works of electronic literature, um, we, can, we can start to, I mean again you can see here now where the barriers are. So if I wanted to do this, well I actually, that's my next example, I'll get to that. Um, so this is holds the database driven work. Um, and because it's a database, because it's got plain text on the front end, it's very easy for me to extract that and do an analysis. Um, so you can see a very simple, most frequent word analysis, obviously with stop word uh, applied. And you can see the, the top 10 most frequent words here. Um, and when you break those down and see, well, is there anything actually significant in what these words are telling us? Um, the one thing that really struck me was that there was a real relationship between the form and content. Now, obviously, you know, there, in any form of active communication, there's a, a relationship between the form and the content, but it was particular because form is so so essential to. Um, I mean, if you consider most literature, most literature uh, in terms of its form, and um, so if you consider like uh, just any print book, um, with certain exceptions aside, so say for example, you know the the concrete post flux movement, and uh, you know material modernists and so on, most people when they write their novel. And I, you know, again, this is my perspective as a publisher. Um, they give me a Word document with their content. And they will have input into things like the cover design and whatnot, but the form is essentially dictated by me and the constraints of, of printing. Um, and, you know, there's only so much create, there's only so creative some, you know, one can be with that. A book will be a book. Whereas with electronic literature, the form, you know, can be as much a part of, of the you know significance and meaning of the work than the actual content, because you know you have the opportunity to to be creative with with uh, with your digital apparatus. And what was interesting to me was that. Because Holes is this, I mean, Holes is autobiographical writing in its, its sort of purest sense. You know, it's a one line a day poem. Um, this he's been writing for 10 years, and I'm now convinced we'll write until the day he dies. So, the great irony, of course, of Holes is one day will be suited to an edition. Um, but we see this in, you know, the, the most frequent word in, in Holes is time. And that to me was interesting because, you know, this, at a meta level, this is, this is a work about time. Uh, its form is a form that is derived out of this poem's need to be um, evolving in a chronological sense. And, and um, the, see that represented in content was, was interesting to me. You know, life writing, this of course is a, you know, we fall under the genre of life writing, we see that in, in the sort of uh, the, sort of the um, the fact that we see the, the author's kind of persona and, 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 and personal sense uh, embedded in the text. And of course this whole notion between public and private. Um, one of the things that will be, uh, be an interesting study to conduct on holes is um, detect any patterns in um, how the author has switched his style um, pre and post digitization. So before this was digitized, um, oh when did we digitize it? Um, 
he had probably written about six years before it was digitized. So it'd be interesting to see if we compare it, but you know, the first six years with the subsequent four years when it was public, if there's been any shifts. And you can, you can do that um, computationally. So that's all well and good. You think, well, that's, you know, that's a nice simple approach. We apply that to works in the uh, electronic literature. We can draw things from that. Then you try to apply to something like the arrestor and it becomes problematic. Now I have applied it to the arrestor here and it worked fine. But first I had to transcribe the entire script, which was about 8,000 words of transcription, which isn't an insurmountable amount of transcription, but if you wanted to build a robust data set to do this in a very, uh, to do this sort of take a big data approach to this, you know, that is insurmountable. Um, and another thing, this highlights one of the problems I got at in terms of the extra textual components. So, the rest there, you can see here the most frequent words, are very much representative of the space. Okay, so they're representative of the environment. And again, this is in keeping with the pattern that we saw in holes. This is very much, um, the content is representing the form. So a big thing about the form of the arrestor is it immerses you in this space, in this, in this environment. Um, and you see they're represented here in the rocks, the gulls, you know, the cliff, the island, the moon. You know, the, the, what, what the narrator, so all, what the uh, protagonist, what the narrator speaks, you know, is really reinforcing that sense of place, which is what the affordance is of a walking simulator, you know, and it's what a walking simulator offers its, its, its reader. But the problem that you see here is that in the arrestor, there are an awful lot of um, references that are visual. Um, I mean, oh, yeah. Um, there are a lot of that. Yeah. It's, the next one might be. Uh, where's the next one? My last one. Oh, no. To the bottom right. So, yes, thank you. There's an awful lot of references. Um, that are this was these images come from. You're inside in a cave, and one is you're inside in a house, the other is inside in a cave. So that's why they're so dark. But essentially, um, there's an awful lot of biblical references, and there's a lot of references to think to uh, to, um, to alcoholism, um, and these are represented um, in basically these sort of paintings on various walls that you encounter. So you go inside this abandoned house on the island and you encounter this uh, chemical equation here, which I'm reliably told by my younger sister, who's a pharmacist, that this is how you synthesize alcohol. Um, and you get, you, you know, you get frequent references to Damascus. You see here in a cave it's painted um, in fluorescent paint. Behold, Damascus has fallen. Um, and a lot of the basic, I, I won't get into the details of, of, of what, the, what the, the, the work is about, but you know, this is highly significant in terms of your interpret, you know, if you're going to interpret this piece, um, you know, you need access to these materials. And they're not in the lexia. So if you do a text analysis of something like the arrestor, you lose all of these components. Um, and that doesn't happen in print literature because typically everything is there on the page. Um, so in terms of content, we've got a lot of limitations. So this brings us to the real crux of my, my question of my, my purpose here. How can I understand the electronic literature, uh, electronic literature's evolution benefit from, from distant reading? And in this respect, you could have more success. So, my data set um, that I use in this, in this uh, study, the, electron, the ELO, the Electronic Literature Organization, is sort of the, um, I mean, it's sort of the unofficial governing body of the, of, the, uh, of, the, of the field of electronic literature. It's a community group run by a number of scholars and artists um, who are involved in electronic literature. Uh, it organizes various things. It organizes, um, you know, the major conference in the field, um, which I'm actually stumbled into this summer. Um, and uh, you know, it, it basically generates awareness around electronic literature and creates resources around electronic literature. 
And they have, they have published three anthologies of electronic literature, so web-based anthologies. Um, you can see them there at the link, collection.eliteracture.org. And they've published three volumes to date, one in 2006, one in 2011, and one in 2016. And what is very valuable about these collections, from my perspective, is that they offer artist statements, or author statements, rather. And what's very valuable about this is that it's very rare in the literary world, I mean, it's not unheard of, but it is rare in the, in the general sense, to have an author actually describe what a work is about, how it works, and very much from a formalist sense. So we can see here that you know, the authors actually talk about you know, the sort of aesthetic intent of the piece and why they use the technologies that they did. And in looking at the evolution of something like electronic literature, that's a very, very valuable resource. Um, and it, I, mean, I mean, that would be a lovely resource in all literature, but fortunately it doesn't exist. So what I did, uh, and this exists for, for each of, each of the, the collections. Now, there was a bit of data cleaning that had to be done in the sense that one of the things that they did with the third collection was the editors decided to include older pieces that they felt you know, needed to be sort of, um, you know, deserve sort of uh, reinterrogation. Um, so I removed those from the work, and that is slightly subjective. But otherwise, there wasn't a whole lot of cleaning to be done. So I simply got a, um, um, I just web harvested all of this content. It's just, this is uh, basically front page HTML, so it's very easy to, very easy to automate the extraction of it. Um, and I started then by looking at the, um, by looking at the frequency of terms over time. And at the surface level, a number of interesting things appear. Um, firstly, we can see that there's been this gradual decline in the use of, um, and I mean, this is particularly interesting because, you know, again, it, this comes from the authors, not the editors. Which is, which is particularly valuable. Um, we can see over time that there's been a decline in text, uh, which is interesting because I, you know, that, that's representative, I think, of the, um, of course it's representative of the, you know, the emergence of things like literary games and you know, highly you know, computationally complex pieces that focus very much more on the side of the interaction and they do the work, but of course correlated with that is the fact that interactivity is, is declining. But I mean that for me is a consequence of the fact that one of the things that you notice with the first generation works is that they very much emphasized um, sort of, they, they accepted that, well not the first generation works, the works published in the first anthology, they very much accepted that this stuff was very new. And um, it's not that they were attempting to justify the approach, but they really you know, the, it was clear that the authors placed an emphasis on demonstrating to, to readers what the value of this work was. So things like, you know, this is different because it's, it's interactive. Now again, interactivity, I think a lot of scholars uh, and practitioners really tend to confuse that interactivity with choice, but I'll get into that another day. Um, um, you see a decline in things like interface because, you know, obviously we see that, you know, again, in, in, in the early days people were very obsessed, you know, like, outlining that the interface does something and, and from a literary perspective. Whereas now, you know, contem contemporary interfaces, we're living very much in the age of, you know, when people talk about digital natives, what they really mean is interface natives. Um, we're living in the age of, you know, the sort of, the, you know, interfaces that have completely effaced themselves um, in terms of what they do. Um, we see here, uh, uh, what's very interesting is um, a sort of a polemic shift from, um, the use of the word space to the use of the word world, which again is very representative of the fact that this field is continuing to emerge with the literary gaming. Um, and we're very much getting to the sort of the ludic end of Enslin's spectrum, in the sense that um, you know people are really starting to, you know, when, when electronic literature first emerged, people were thinking about, you know, these kind of the affordances of the digital space that the works are occupying, whereas now people are talking about worlds, which is very much sort of has a lot of connotations in terms of you know, the fact that they're constructing these very immersive, um, very intentional spaces that they see as, 
as uh, as game worlds. And of course, what what I love here is this very sharp decline in the rise of the term reader. So I think one of the things that you notice with in terms of how electronic literature has evolved is how authors have become much more certain that this is literature. And that's not to say that the first collection was comprised of authors who didn't see their work as literature. But I think they weren't as comfortable with calling their, the, the readers readers. You, you see a much higher proportion of the term users in the first collection. Um, because I think they weren't quite sure um, what you know, they knew they were transacting with a group of people, but I don't think they were quite sure that these... Um, uh, do these lines represent one word or some semantic group? Sorry, yeah, so it's, it's possibly not clear from the, from the, uh, from the guy. Yeah, these are just one word, so it's just it's a, frequ it's a relative frequency graph of the word that is, that is highlighted, which you possibly can't see the, the highlighted word. Um, we'll come to the semantic groups. Uh, well, um, so this is also isn't quite clear, but this is um, a collocation analysis. So a collocation analysis um, basically represents, as again many of you probably know, uh, represents words that uh, tend to be frequently uh, appear together. So take for example, um, strong coffee would be a collocation. Um, So, so, in the first collection, uh, again, interactivity was, there was a high level of centrality. I mean, text is the most, is the dominant term throughout. Uh, experience and process. So, you know, again, there was this interactive process. There was this real emphasis on this idea of, you know, computational, that they were very much concerned with describing how it is, what it is that the work was doing from a computational sense, so that people who are new, I mean, this was essentially the first, the first very public, very uh, high profile anthology of electronic literature. And it was very clear that authors, you know, really uh, placed an emphasis on, on describing their works in terms that, that you know, uh, that people aren't familiar with the field uh, could understand. And that, you know, they really wanted to put across the idea that the value in this work is in the interactive computational process. Um, and that starts to um, uh, devolve a bit as, as we move into the second collection and we start to see the rise of things like, we start to see sort of the influence of multimodality emerge much more here now. So you start to see things like animation, sound, game emerge, you know, touching, you know, we start to see the rise of gesture. Which then comes to, you know, the third collection which is now very much embedded in things like um, you know, augmented reality and uh, some of the sort of new uh, emer uh, uh, technologies that we're starting to see, see emerge. I mean, one of the things that electronic, I mean, I, uh, electronic literature very much emerges out of a, a tradition of, uh, of um, I like to call it perverse engineering. Um, and it's, they very much appropriate uh, you can see a lot of affinity, affinities with the modernist movement in the sense that they appropriate sort of found art and found technologies, and they you know they take technologies that have been created for some other purpose and, and, and apply them to their to their for their uh, to, to uh, for their artistic vision, um, and so you know virtual reality now is, is is a big thing. So you know straight away, I mean at the electronic literature exhibit this year, you know there was a number of pieces using virtual reality and all, augmented reality has been explored by electronic literature, um, electronic literary artists for the last, I'd say, five, six years at least. Uh, so you can very quickly see that, you know, that sort of move towards augmented and virtual is being represented in, in, the, in the third collection. Um, so having looked at the frequency of the terms, I then wanted to turn to other approaches. Um, and the next one I looked at was, was, um, was topic modeling. Um, and topic modeling, again, as many of you probably know, is basically a form of of, um, of generative statistical modeling that basically works on the assumption that um, you know any document is, is based off a finite uh, a, a finite number of, of topics, and that we can model these topics. 
Uh, I did this using Mallet, which again I'll tweet out the link for. I'm sure many of you have, have worked with Mallet before. Um, again, it's 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 been criticised. Um, one of the failings of it is that it is a very contextless approach, but of course, in many respects, that is the value of, of distant reading. And using the, 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 the author descriptions, I can go up to the top of the modeling, just for the sake of brevity, I've picked out a few of the kind of key topics here for you. And you can see that in volume one, there was very much an emphasis on collaboration. And, and this is interesting because In volume one, a lot of volume one, while it was published in 2006, a lot of the works were written long before that. And they were written sort of um, before the advent of um, very intuitive, uh, the very intuitive platforms we have now for, for multimedia production. So authors that wanted to do something, say, that was particularly visual, Typically, had to find a have had to find a collaborator who had experience in that in that domain. Um, obviously, hypertext was still the big fit genre of the time, um, and there was also a a lot of um, of this of, of topics around multimodality. So again, this idea of you know authors were really trying to emphasise well, this is you know this is literature, but it uses sound, it uses images, it uses the visual. In volume two, then, um, there was sort of, uh, it was very clear that authors were much more comfortable with this notion of multimodality. They no longer broke down modalities into things like, you know, sound, uh, you know, image, letters, um, you know, they just, they just spoke in broader terms like multimedia. Um, again, there was the rise of the interface. Um, there was. Um, this topic, uh, and I mean these are representative of a number of topics. One of the things that's interesting to me is that uh, there's a lot of uh, of gender terms emerge in the second volume, um, and there is a there is a big uh, feminist e, e literature core. Um, but what was interesting to me was that it emerged in the in the second uh, collection as opposed to the first. I haven't quite established why that is yet. Um, spaces again is interactive, um, so people stop. You know, people start talking about this idea of you know spaces, games, form. I mean, we can see this was 2011. Or the idea of a literary game was very much was very much starting to emerge. Um, and I mean, this this I mean this corresponds with the emergence of a lot of you know open source game engines and um, very powerful open source lightweight game engines that allow people to start exploring more complex and sophisticated. Um, I'm off time. Okay. Um, Volume 3, 2016, we start to see the rise of mobile electronic literature, which is big now. Um, you know, people start talking about platforms. So in kind of volumes one and volume two authors typically assume that when people were reading from the screen, they were reading from this kind of screen. Whereas now, of course, you know, the screen is, is it can mean a lot of different things. Um, there was an expansion of forms in the sense that there's very much been a reconnection of the physical in the electronic literature in the sense of things like augmented reality, virtual reality, um, you know, people working with um, uh, infrared sensors and this kind of thing. Um, bots. Bots are big now. Of course, this is obviously a reflection of the interests of, of the editors, but a lot of people now are starting to do things with Twitter bots and whatnot. Um, so you see that represented, but of course, you know, the extent to read, you read, you, in which you read into that is one of the editors is 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 a big is a, one of the kind of leading scholars in the area of bots. So it's probably uh, there's not much of significance there. So having looked at the the content, so I've looked at the kind of textual, the uh, the textual analysis. I wanted to then. I wanted to explore, and I'm more interested in this, actually, I think there's more value, I think there's more potential in this in terms of what I can tell us about the field. Um, I wanted to move to contextual analysis. So for that, I started looking at network analysis. Um, and um, 
Again, brief description of network analysis. So network analysis is very much just about um, visualizing and uh, analyzing the represent the, uh, the the relationship between various nodes. And by a node, we mean some entities or so people, for example. This is the definition that that Scott Weingarten offers on his 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 wonderful blog, Scott Block, where he basically says that um, that network analysis is about uh, is about interlocking systems between stuff uh, that represents stuff and relationships. So essentially, in our case, um, you know, the stuff will be the authors and their their publishers, and the relationships will be the relationship between the author and publisher. So here's the network analysis. You've got your nodes, you've got your edges, so you've got your stuff, and you've got your relationships, as Weingart puts it. And so this is where I mentioned earlier, you know, there were people who had been, there have been some scholars who have been, uh, you know, playing with computational methods in in the uh, study of electronic literature, so I'll wrap this up very quickly. Um, so this is uh, Jill, one of these is, is Jill Walker Redberg, who did a fantastic study where she looked at, basically she visualized the um, the network of works being cited by uh, dissertations on electronic literature. Um, I think it was, uh, it was between 60 to 80 dissertations. Um, which is a lot of dissertations on electronic literature. Um, I think everyone who does the dis their dissertation on the electronic literature, I did mine on the electronic literature, thinks they're the first person doing a dissertation on the electronic literature. Um, but essentially what you can see here is that, you know, in terms of the centrality, it's all about the first generation the electronic literature. So Patchwork Girl, Michelle Jackson, um, Afternoon the Story, Victory Garden, these are all mid to mid 80s to mid 90s. They're all part of the, the Eastgate School. Um, so there is that emphasis on the sort of first generation of it. So, um, what I did in terms of network analysis is um, I went to LMSIP. So LMSIP is a crowd-sourced database of electronic electronic uh, works of electronic literature. Uh, it also it also so basically it is just it has. Almost 3,000 records of creative works. Uh, it also has it maintains a similar database for critical works. Um, but I was interested in the creative works, and I was interested in looking at basically if. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, a lot of my scholarship emerged out of my uh, sort of tied into my uh, practice as a publisher, and I, I was interested to see the. Inf I'm interested in. I am. This is a study done that I'm very much engaged in at present. I'm very interested in seeing the influence of publishers on electronic literature because one of the things that is very different about electronic literature in comparison with print literature is you don't really need a publisher. So if you go ahead and you create something in hypertext fiction, what is it? I mean, it's, it's, in a traditional sense, it's very clear to see what a publisher provides. They make the they make the book a thing. They make the work a book. Whereas in electronic literature, it's very easy for someone to create a hypertext fiction and just put it online. So what is it that the publisher provides? That's a different argument. Um, but what I went, I went to LMSIP, so um, I went to, this project is run by Scott Redberg, who very kindly provided me with, with an output of this data, and I represented it as a network analysis to see who the dominant publishers were. Obviously, there's no real way for me to, I wasn't sure, I was going to actually show you the, the act of network analysis. I'm after redoing this as a, um, using D3, um, using the D3 library. But I feel like it would crash the computer, so maybe I won't show it to you. Um, but essentially, if we look at that sort of cluster, so essentially what we're seeing here is that there are these dominant publishers in the middle, um, and we've got all of these less dominant publishers on the periphery. And you can't see that from this, but essentially what we're seeing here is you're showing this is very much tied to chronology. So what we've got here in the middle are the the, for the first generation publishers, so people like the Eastgate School, um, the Eastgate, or, uh, Eastgate Systems, uh, the Electronic Literature Organization, sort of the people who were publishing the electronic literature before anybody else even knew what it was. And outside here then you have people like you know, me, who have sort of, who have entered um, into electronic literature very much in, in, in the contemporary era, so publishers that have emerged in the last sort of 10 years or so. Um, 
So you can see that represented when you zoom in. I mean, the electronic literature organization is the dominant force. You know, up here we've got Eastgate Systems. Um, down here we've got Turbulence, which is an old journal that actually has just been, uh, has just been archived by the electronic literature organization. Um, so, um, and when you, again, I have this on the D3, I just use a slider to represent this so you can see the network expand over time. But essentially when you look at this, um, when you represent this as a line graph, and if you look at the number of works, so this is interesting, you might, you might notice that there was 3,000 records in Elmsip, but of course, of those 3,000 records, only about half of them, actually less, about 1,200, actually have a publisher. So there is a doc, but there is a, um, and I, that, I don't know if that's because the record is incomplete or because uh, the works were self-published, I assume it's the latter. Uh, well, the, the authors just, you know, self-publication is probably the right word, they just, they make the works available. Um, but you can see that, um, basically over time, there has been a rise in the number of works that are being, being published by, um, by publishers. Um, I think this is you know, re sort of representative of the increasing le legitimization of, of electronic literature and, and um, you know, increasing interest in the fact that you know, publishers are now interested in, in actually putting their name to this. But what is significant is that there has been, around 2010, 2009, 2010, there was a big drop off in this. Um, now I think that's tied into very much what I was saying about it's very difficult for a uh, for a publisher to actually offer something to a, an author of, of electronic literature. And of course, what we're seeing now in in around 2008, 2009, when authors were building, one of the big things that a publisher can offer is the uh, infrastructure that you need to make something available. So one of the things that I do for my authors is if they have a piece that they simply, they don't have the server that can run it, I have the server that can run it. I put it on my server, that's what I offer them. Whereas, um, and I think around 2008, 2009, you would have seen a lot of those works emerge. People were starting to play with very immersive, um, you know, very, uh, very um, bandwidth heavy technologies, things like video. Um, and of course, you know, immersive game spaces. And they, you know, once these works were created, they simply had, you know, publishing into the web wasn't as easy as people make it out to be. Um, and publishers provided infrastructure, whereas now you're seeing, you're starting to see the rise of like independent development groups like the Chinese Room, who have found ways to commercialize their works. And so again, they're both, you know, producer and publisher rolled into one. So again, the need for, for publishers declining. I think that's one of the big, big shifts in the evolution of the electronic literature. Um, and that's, I think, where, uh, well, that is where I'm now emphasizing, where I'm, where I'm, um, that's the strand I'm going to pursue with this study. So, um, very quick conclusions. Um, I mean, Elit works, despite the fact that they have all of this multimodality and the fact that they do uh, represent a lot of their meaning through things like visuals and sound, you know, they do still very much at their core privilege language. So there is a lot of potential for text-based, for computer-assisted text-based analysis. The problem being, of course, that you do lose something. I think that something is more significant than what you lose when you're dealing with print literature. Um, and you have issues in terms of getting access to the data, some of which I, I, I will find. Um, there is a lot of value, I think, in, in contextual analysis as demonstrated by Redberg and as I'm pursuing in, in, in my uh, contextual analysis. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I will uh, leave it there. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, James, and I think it's a good time to start the discussion. I will, I, I'm sure there will be several questions around. I have several questions myself, but yeah, I will, just, I will just speak for myself. So, yeah, any questions, any remarks, any ideas where to go? Maybe just one question. Um, well, given that the literature is available in the internet, You've got the means to actually, uh, well, trace the reception. I mean, see how many people uh, read this and what they do with this. And have, you, have you tried to track them to analyze this data? So one of the things that um, we're looking at is using logs from um, 
particularly hypertext-based works, um, to track how users uh, interact with the piece itself. So how, for example, they traverse the narrative. Um, and what I'd be interested to see with that is to see if there's any sort of particular trends across the board. In terms of actually um, looking at how users interact in a kind of a broader sense, I hadn't considered that. So when you say like track sort of you know how users come to this work, you know how they leave, um, that would I, I mean that would be very interesting to me from a publisher sense from a, a commercial sense would be very very interesting from a literary <coughs> sort of interpretive sense um, I'm not sure what you can draw from it well I mean there's also all this stuff that you would do when if, if you were uh, selling a product which is like you know where the person clicked where the mouse yeah. uh, cursor went and so on and so on so you, I mean, you can actually apply all those truths to, to see where the, well, not exactly where the person looked, yeah. you know, what, what, what he looked at, uh, but um, what he thought he might interact with. Yeah, there, one, uh, one thing I've tried, uh, I looked at, I did a, stu a very small, I said a study where I, I looked at, I just did some heat mapping to see how people are interacting with pieces. But there's actually, a, there's an AH, the, um, the big fund being council in the UK is the Arts and Humanities Research Council, the AHRC. And in Sheffield Hallam, so the other Sheffield University, there actually is a big AHRC project uh, run by uh, the PIs, or Alice Bell and Astrid Enslin, who I mentioned, she wrote the book, uh, she developed the Lula Literary Spectrum. And it's called, Lula, it's uh, Reading Digital Fiction, is the name of the project. And they're actually doing, uh, cognitive analysis of readers, um, so basically they're introducing electronic literature to readers who um, have never really engaged with it before, and they're um, they're basically you know uh, measuring their cognitive responses is, uh, and drawing conclusions from that. Now that's very much work ongoing; they haven't presented any findings yet. Um, but they should, yeah, they're pro it's probably a two-three year cycle, so I'm sure they'll find them soon. Um, so I mean that would be very very interesting. Um, um, from uh, yeah, that would be very, very interesting. Very, very interesting. Um, I mean, the heat the heat map approach was interesting in the sense that I mean, I kept mentioning that difference between interactivity and choice. I mean, for me, interactivity is isn't about the narrative selections that users are presented with. It's the way that they engage with the piece. And what was very clear from the heat map was that. You know, um, there are instances where readers don't necessarily make their selection based on any narrative force. They make it based on the design of the piece. And I'm not sure of the extent to which electronic authors consider design in that respect. Um, but that was a very limited, limited study. Um, but it'll be something you'd be it'd be very interesting to expand, certainly. Thank you. Questions to any popular quotes are and um, is the poem connected with photos? Yes, so Holes has I mean so the main emphasis of Holes is the one line a day, but there's also there is a gallery um yeah that contains, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> there is a gallery that contains a number of photographs that uh, Graham takes, um, basically as he's just wandering about his daily life. The significance of them, I wouldn't be able, I wouldn't like to comment on, um, in the sense that um, I, I don't think I would do it justice. Um, yeah. Um, I would say that, and again, I, I don't want to represent the artist's viewpoint here, but I would suspect that the visual elements are an afterthought. And we're actually in the process of, because the, we're in the process of redeveloping the whole thing to make it more interactive. And one of the things that we have, we're discussing is what actually to do with the, with the images. Um, but they are, in many respects, a visual representation of sort of what it is he's doing with the lines. But there, uh, there's a lot less regularity. They're not updated every day. They're added in batches every few months. Um, 
and there, there wouldn't be nearly as many images as, as there are as there are lines. Um, and actually, going back to this idea of how people are interacting with the piece, one thing I've never actually tr measured but would be interesting would be how many people actually view the image. I obviously track user, user interactions with the, the text, but I've never actually looked at how they interact with the images. So that would be a way of actually determining what their significance is. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask a tiny question about the uh, the size of the market. Actually, you were showing us uh, the database of three almost three thousand um, entries. Is it just the tip of an iceberg, or that's the iceberg? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that is, well, now, Ellen Sip. No, that's not the iceberg. It's it's the tip of the iceberg, but it's all we have in terms of records. There aren't really any other sources like uh, like Ellen Sip. There are others, um, but uh, the most exhaustive is probably LMSIP. Uh, it doesn't, as my understanding is, it doesn't have institutional funding anymore. Uh, well, it doesn't have grant funding anymore. Um, so it's very much a crowdsourced project now, and it's you know the, the, the database is building as you know people people uh, contribute new entries. Um, so one of the big limitations of that of my, um, my analysis there, of course, is that it doesn't represent works uh, that aren't in Elmsib, and it's also skewed towards a sort of ELO-centric view of the community of electronic literature. So say, for example, um, you know, in different communities, um, I mean, I know, for example, it, it's a very anglo-centricized approach in a lot of ways, uh, representation in a lot of ways. So I know, for example, that there's a big uh, elit community in the Arabic world that have increasingly started engaging now with this, with the, um, with the kind of North American community and the European community to some extent, um, and you're starting to see, um, you know, entries relevant, you know, entries written by um, by Middle Eastern artists, artists being added to the database, but obviously, you know, that that's the work of one or two scholars, and that's going to take time before that. That is sufficient to see there to see them represented uh, in a macro analysis, um, and of course I know that there's been a lot of development in terms of uh, uh, in terms of the African elite community, but I mean a lot of that isn't in LMC. So, you, you know, two major limitations: one, it doesn't have all the all the data, um, and two, uh, it is very much centered around a sort of um, you know North American ELO. Uh, community, um, but there is. I mean, that's. I mean, that's the thing. This. This is such a sort of. It is a small field, uh, in a lot of respects. Um, so the, I mean, the, this, that data isn't essentially, isn't essentially there. Um, no, I mean, Amazon is a wonderful resource, but you know, it's like any crowdsourced project. It's only as. It's only as good as the contributions that have been made by the, by the community. Um, so yeah. Mm -hmm. So the fact that the ELO is sort of central in that network analysis is probably, in many respects, to be expected. And um, what I didn't expect was that you would get such a split between the centrality of the the uh, the groups that have, have been doing it, um, the first generation publishers say, versus the newer ones. And you might say, well, that's to be expected because they've been doing it longer. But a lot of these groups aren't active anymore. So the fact that there's still these dominant forces in an network analysis is interesting. Um, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, questions? I actually feel encouraged to ask another question, if I may. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're showing these trains, increasing and increasing trains of uh, know, some world occurrences. I did very, very similar stuff, yet um, applying uh, topic modeling. Mm -hmm. For a database of um, 24 years of the um, um, scholarly uh, journal on literature uh, in Polish, texted Rubia, or the second text, whatever it means. And uh, I was observing some trains, decreasing and decreasing trains, and I, I, I was able to, to trace two topics in the center of which the word text was you know, pre predominant in the first place. But this word text, in the first uh, case, was surrounded by the words like uh, book, uh, readers, you know, this kind of 
traditional yeah. stuff. And, and in the second uh, case, it was text surrounded by uh, interactivity, something like that. You know, all the all the uh, um, the constellation of of uh, modern and you know postmodern ones, something like that, right? And one of those trends, this traditional one, was decreasing, while the other one was uh, very very. Um, uh, much increasing. Yeah. So my question is, did you ever try, or did you ever think of, you know, contrasting this kind of trends between the literature itself and the literary criticists? If they're sort of parallel, or, you know. Um. Yes, that'd be fair. So in that analysis, I did that when that text refers to text as in words, as in text in the material sense, as opposed to the text in the, the metaphorical semantic sense. Um, and I did that using a keyword and context analysis. Um, and pretty much when most people say the word, so it's author saying, you know, they're talking about things like text manipulation as opposed as opposed to this is an interactive text. Um, so the correlate, I mean that would be very interesting to correlate with the criticism. Um, and of course the criticism Applying a computational analysis to criticism would be very easy because criticism is easy to get because it's in you know book form. <laughs> um, so it's, it's not something I've done, but it would be it would be very very interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, it would be. So which in your study, which is declining and which is increasing? Uh, the declining one is traditional text, text, readers, uh, interpretation, okay. this kind of stuff. Okay. And the increasing last, uh, uh, the, the increasing one is text, interactive, interactivity, uh, electronic, ebook, okay. you know, this kind of text. Yeah, certainly what the yeah. So I would suspect in elect I mean in electronic literature I would be surprised to see a lot of references to that the text in that context in electronic literary, literary criticism because most elit critics um, start from the assumption that that isn't what this is but it would be I mean, very it would be very interesting it would be very interesting. and very doable as well because there's obviously a, 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 I mean there's a large body of criticism but again it's not a huge body of criticism. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah very good idea. Thank you. Any other questions? I I, I think that let's let's think again. Of <laughs> Thank you for coming. And thanks, Jesus. Yeah, thanks, thanks again for having me. It's uh, yeah, it's wonderful to be here. Cool. Yeah.